This is the final part of our presentation on forearm fractures from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version 4. I'm Saki Brahman narrating, and this is a presentation created by uh, Dr. Derek Donegan. And um, in our f last session, um, portion of this presentation, I went through uh, the um, surgical treatments, uh, surgical approaches, and in the first um, portion of the talk, uh, we had uh, talked about assessment, uh, clinical exam, uh, anatomical concerns. So now we're going to wrap up by uh, focusing a little bit on complications and also a little bit on special situations, meaning Galeazzi and Montagia lesions. So some of the complications of note are refracture after plate removal. Um, symptomatic hardware, non-union, malunion infection, neurologic injury, compartment syndrome, radio ulnar synestosis. So a couple um, I think you need to be aware of that are particular um, to the forearm um, are uh, these, I think, in, in particular. Uh, and um, although this is also something um, that you need to be uh, aware of. Um, what about hardware removal? So. There's been some literature on hardware removal of the forearm because unfortunately uh, there have been reported refractures and um, hardware coming out and then the patient re refracturing after long periods of time. So it's generally been recommended that you have to wait at least 18 months or even up to two years before removing hardware um, to minimize the refracture risk. Um, Usually fractures will occur through an original fracture or, uh, or a screw hole. Um, and uh, there's higher risk, obviously, with, with larger plates, which we typically don't use. Um, and, and the thing is, post-removal, if patients had what was seen to be hardware uh, irritation, many of them still have uh, symptoms afterwards. So. Um, I have to say, uh, you have to be uh, really convinced there's a problem to take out someone's um, mid-shaft radius and ulna plates for forearm fracture. So it's certainly one of the places where I think hardware removal is just uh, relatively uncommon and I think should be uncommon. It's not really an area where there's a lot of irritation unless you get very proximal or distal. So what about malunion? Well, this is potentially a problem. Um, loss of motion with greater than 10 degrees of angulation um, uh, will um, often uh, uh, be a result of, uh, of malunion. Uh, five degree loss of radial bow equals 15 degrees uh, loss of supination and pronation. I mean, here's an extreme example uh, where you have reversal of the radial bow and angulated ulna fracture uh, and you can see this is a fracture that was treated non-surgically um, and you can also have decreased grip strength with loss of the radial bow. So a case like this optimally would be treated with osteotomy, uh, correction of that deformity and repair. Typically with compression plating and if necessary with bone grafting. Uh, Non-union um, can be due to poor biomechanics, maybe poor technique, didn't use enough screws, didn't compress, bad soft tissue management. Um, sometimes it can just be the initial fracture, degree of comminution if it was open and just uh, less likely to heal as well. And these are treated with revision fixation, bone grafting. Uh, and if you have segmental bone loss, you can um, consider uh, iliac crest uh, bone grafting. Um, so uh, this is a nice described technique. If you take a tricortical graft, it kind of fits in very nicely uh, to substitute for a radius or ulna. It works nicely. So uh, what about neurologic injury? Well, in closed fracture, uh, these are often iatrogenic, um, and the posterior interosseous nerve is at risk with the proximal approach, uh, such as with the uh, Thompson approach, if you don't look for and find the nerve. Inter anterior interosseous nerve uh, palsy can occur with vigorous radial reduction. Um, the radial sensory branch can occur, uh, can be, I'm sorry, injured with um, anterior dorsal exposure uh, and uh, also with, uh, I'm sorry, the AIN can also be injured uh, in open fractures. What about synostosis? Um, 
not common, but it can happen, um, especially uh, when you have a traumatic brain injury with a forearm fracture, both bones at the same level, single incision, um, which is something you rarely do, but uh, that'll do it. Or interosseous membrane penetration, and sometimes you have these um, gunshot injuries where you have a fracture that goes through the radius and ulna, and you know you get all this combination along the interosseous membrane, uh, and they can be at risk. Uh, and treatment is early resection. So what about outcomes? Uh, these are fractures that generally can do very well. And um, Mike Chapman's our early data really sort of pa uh, paved the way for uh, commonplace uh, gold standard, you could say, um, um, appreciation for the compression plating uh, with very good rates of uh, union and uh, function. Um, uh, open fractures uh, do have slightly uh, lower risk of uh, union and poorer function uh, is more common. Um, you know, this is what you want to look for, uh, motion, grip strength, um, and uh, most of the time disability is uh, pain related as shown in, um, uh, in these two JBGS studies. So a little bit about special cases. Well, Sometimes forearm fractures can be associated with this longitudinal instability, such as a Galeazzi lesion or a Montagia um, injury or some type of combined pattern. Uh, you can also get floating elbows and uh, other injuries like with open fractures. So um, when you have joint disruption at the distal or proximal radial ulnar joints, best treatment is ORF with plate fixation of the diaphyseal fracture. And you have to be really anatomic about it. Um, especially with the Montagia uh, lesions uh, where you have really no uh, sloppy, sloppiness in the proximal radial ulnar joint like you do in the distal radial ulnar joint where it kind of slides back and forth a little bit even in normal physiologic circumstances. Um, typically, you know, if you get it anatomic, usually the joint will reduce and become s stable. If it's unstable, you might have to, or if you can, let me put it this way, if you can't get it reduced, you have to first make sure that your diaphyseal fracture is, is perfectly anatomic. And if it is, then you may need to do an open reduction. Um, if you can get the reduction and it's unstable, uh, you may have to immobilize or possibly even pin it, such as with a Galeazzi lesion. Um, and possibly you might need to do an open reduction if you can't get it reduced at all. So the classic Galeazzi lesion is a fracture of the distal third radial shaft with, uh, all right, shown here, with a uh, dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. Um, and you know you have to look at AP and lateral images. Yeah, in this particular case, actually, there's both bones forearm fracture. So let's just ignore that and just, um, let's just say that you have a uh, radius fracture Okay, so we're getting that radius fracture with the DRUJ dislocation. That's the classic uh, Galeazzi lesion. Um, I pointed to the wrong bone before. Um, but, you know, you can have variants. Fracture can occur anywhere along the radius. Um, typically, it's distal. Um, and um, it could be associated with fractures of both bones, as is shown in this example here. Um, you could have a very small fracture at the base of the ulnar styloid. You want to look for widening or, um, you know, you have this sort of vertical instability here of the disarray ulnar joint, greater than five millimeters of radial shortening here. Um, and uh, uh, there was a paper that had shown that uh, radius fractures less than seven and a half centimeters from the wrist joint were at higher risk for developing a DRUJ dislocation. And again, that's why it's usually seen in distal third radial shaft fractures. Uh, these always require plate fixation of the radius. Um, and uh, if, it's, if you can reduce it and it's unstable, you may have to consider pins across the distal radial ulnar joint. You've got to be really careful, though, that uh, you don't move them early. You keep them immobilized. Uh, these pins can break right about here if you're not careful. Uh, and that's, that's a bad day. You don't want to see that happen. Um, so the DRUJ is stable. You can mobilize them for a short period of time and then start motion. If it's unstable, you need to immobilize them uh, and, you know, plus or minus pins. 
So they may be associated with uh, damage to the triangular fiber cartilage at the, dis at the uh, uh, ulnar side of the wrist, which could require surgery also. Um, Montagia lesion. So classically, the Montagia lesion is a fracture of the proximal third of the ulna with dislocation of the radial head. And it can be, uh, it can be anterior. And this is, a, this is sort of your Beto classification. Uh, it can be posterior, you know, the radial head. Uh, or you can have uh, types 3 and 4, which are much less common. Uh, but the most common one you're going to see usually is the radial head dislocated anteriorly. Okay, here you can see an example of uh, at least a C-arm image showing the radial... And you got to get perfect elbow x-rays to, to identify this, and it'll show the radial head dislocated anteriorly. So remember, in a normal x-ray, a line drawn through the radial shaft right, should intersect with the capitellum and not go completely anterior to it as is shown here. Um, on a supinated lateral, lines drawn tangential to the head anteriorly and posteriorly should pretty much enclose the capitellum, right? So this is a montagia lesion. So after fixation of the uh, ulna, and again, you have to be very anatomic about it, the radial head usually will reduce and be stable. Um, if it's not, check your length, check that you didn't um, maybe under contour the plate, uh, for instance, uh, which can allow the um, uh, radius to persist uh, and sublux anteriorly. Um, occasionally, rarely, you may have, to do an, may have to do an open reduction and then ligament repair. If you have a comminuted radial head fracture, you might have to replace it or repair it if it's less comminuted. Um, Post-op treatment depends on the rigidity of your ulnar fixation and stability of the radial head. Um, usually you'll mob immobilize them for a short period of time, but if it's stable reduction, you'll get them moving. And the longer you wait, you'll be stable, but more likely you'll have some stiffness with uh, supination and pronation. Okay, so um, just show the uh, concluding slides here from the literature. And uh, this concludes the... Uh, Part three of um, this uh, three-part presentation on uh, forearm fractures from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Resident Lecture Series, um, version four, um, Saka Brahman narrating, uh, slides uh, created by Derek Donegan. And um, uh, to conclude, forearm fractures are inherently unstable. The vast majority require operative fixation. The goal is anatomic reduction with stable fixation. Uh, you want to restore ulnar length. Uh, radial bow and length, respect to soft tissues, and remember, uh, don't miss injuries at joint above and joint below uh, with uh, those Galeazzi and Montagia lesions. Thank you very much.